everyone. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us. And I'm going to hand it off to our current chamber chair, Ms. Janetta Everett. Janetta, take it away. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to part two of the Journey Unseen series with Ms. Shelley Pritchard. All of you are, you are in for a treat today. If you, whether this is your first or second Journey Unseen, we are so pleased that you join us today for a fireside conversation with another professional woman in our community. If you missed the first one, you will get a chance to hear it. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but buckle up for this one. I am Janetta Everett. I'm the Vice President of Professional Relations at Delta Dental of Kansas, and I am the 2020 Board Chair of the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, and it is my honor to welcome you here today. Before we get started with everything, I want to say thank you, Jonathan, for, for the, uh, working the crowd a little bit, identifying who's out there. I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, you were muted as you came in, as you joined us this morning, so stay muted. Uh, until the breakout rooms and uh, the Q&A portion of the event. We're gonna ask that you please turn on your cameras because we really wanna make this as normal as possible. So we wanna be able to see your faces. Besides, I might wanna do a shout out every now and then. Uh, just, you never know when I'm gonna say something. Uh, right, Melissa, while you're drinking your coffee there? <laughs> All right. We recommend that you switch to your speaker view to optimi uh, optimize your experience. This kind of just helps a lot on the um, presentation in itself. And please rename yourself with your full name and if applicable, your organization's company name. And lastly, please feel free to use the reaction buttons uh, to interact with any uh, anything throughout the fireside chat. So, First, I'd like to say this event would not even be possible without our program sponsors. Um, I'm gonna recognize our program sponsors, which would be our, our presenting sponsor, corporate host, BKD LLP, Martin Kringle, attorney at law, McCown Gordon Construction, and Thrive Restaurant Group. Our speaker sponsor for today is, a, is in a company I know a little bit about, is Delta Dental of Kansas. And our meal sponsor is the Monarch, always, always supportive. Thank you so much. And I can't stress enough, though, how these events, such as these, would not be possible at all without their sponsors. So please take time to thank them for their generosity. So joining us today is Lottie De Silva, who is Managing Director of Signal Theory. Um, I'd like to invite Lottie for a few remarks. Uh, Lottie, take it away. Thank you so much, Janetta. I am really excited to be here today. And um, I wanted to also make sure everyone understood that, uh, you know, even though we're here virtually, there's no keeping us smart women from getting together. So I'm really happy that we can do this. And as presenting sponsor, we're really excited to support Journey Unseen. And it's such a great effort where the Chamber is able to bring and facilitate the importance of mentorship for each other. And so I have the pleasure of introducing and, and helping um, present to you uh, Shelly Pritchard, who I greatly admire, and I want to tell you why. So in uh, our business, we uh, at Signal Theory are really centered on thinking about humans and understanding the human, uh, why we make decisions the way we do and how we market for our brands. And when I think about being human centered, there is no one more human centered than Shelly Pritchard. And when I think of Shelly, what she has done for our community is all about thinking of a better tomorrow and saying, how can we have uh, help our communities in need and help make our city better? So I am really excited for you to hear her wit and wisdom today. And please welcome Shelly. Thank you. Thank you, Lati, so much. I agree with every word she said. Uh, moderating today's conversation with Shelly is the Miss Christina Long. But before I introduce you to Christina, I do want to ask that once Shelly's fireside uh, chat starts, please use the Zoom chat function for all your questions, and then there's going to be an opportunity for Shelly to, to answer them uh, during the Q&A portion. So please use your Zoom and your chat function. Christina Long, I can't really say a lot about her. That, that just almost doesn't sometimes, 
Terria because she's such an awesome person. She's an entrepreneur. She's a community builder. She's uh, one who has passionate about diversity, inclusion, and economic development throughout the entrepreneurship uh, faction. She is the owner of Miss CML Collective LLC, which is a graphic design and community service company. And she's the founder of the Create Campaign, um, a nonprofit that activates urban entrepreneurs um, in Kansas as to launch. Uh, most people in Wichita know who Christina Long is. Uh, I would like to welcome, ladies and gentlemen, who are on this page, Miss Christina Long. Thank you so much, Jeanette. I really appreciate that introduction and Lottie, great job as well, um, giving a good cue up to who Shelly is. Um, again, I'm Christina Long and it is my privilege to be able to be here to facilitate an amazing conversation with an incredible woman, Shelly Pritchard. Just quickly so we can have some formality and do some honoring as well. Shelly Pritchard joined the foundation, the Wichita Community Foundation, as its president and CEO in November of 2012. Her previous role, and this is very important, included being the CEO of the Girl Scouts of Kansas Heartland, and she served as the Executive Director of Youth Entrepreneurs of Kansas. Her first job in Wichita was as Community Relations Manager for Coke Industries. She is a Newton, Kansas native, and she has earned a bachelor's degree with honors in journalism and mass communications at, where else, K-State. <laughs> in addition to her professional career, Pritchard has served on many boards and advisory groups, including the Kansas 4-H Foundation, the Kansas State University Alumni Association, and the Rotary Club of Wichita. She is active in her church, St. Thomas Aquinas, and likes to cook. I think likes is an understatement, <laughs> loves to cook, loves to be outside with her family and their dog, Lando, and go to K-State football games. Mm -hmm. Shelly, welcome to Journey Unseen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. When we talk about, and I said this last time, the, the title of this series, The Journey Unseen, so many people just see us in the public sphere, the public space, and have no idea what we have had to encounter and had to endure in order to be the women who we are today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited for what you're going to be able to share with us. So let's let's start off. Let's go okay. dig down deep all the way back. Okay. Tell us about growing up, and most importantly, tell me about your dad. Uh, we'll start with that one. <laughs> yeah, we're going to start. We're okay. going to start deep. Well, I'm a farm kid from Newton, Kansas. Uh, my dad was a veterinarian, and so he worked 60 plus hours a week in the vet practice. But then we had about 150 cows. Um, so I grew up. 4-H was a very, very important part of my life, and so I'm thrilled to be a part of the State 4-H Foundation now to provide some leadership there. Um, so we worked very hard. I have two wonderful sisters, and mom stayed home with us, um, but, you know, was out there on the farm with us. So I can weld. I've taught, I don't know how many men, how to change a tire, um, paint fences, and do all, do all the things that I think have been really, really helpful to te teach work ethic and just you figure out a way to get it done. And we, had, we weren't wealthy at all, and so I can fix a lot of things. The old adage of with bailing wire or you know bailing wire and duct tape I can make things happen so um, mm -hmm. um, it, it was a wonderful way to grow up um, I was really really close to my dad mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately my dad was killed in a car accident uh, now 35 years ago um, and I was 20 he was 46 so you know it's, it was tough and I miss him every day not not you know boo-hoo miss him but like I'd love for him to watch today right. um, and I'd love to be able to have those conversations with him so it really shaped my life in appreciating what you have and appreciating the people around you. Um, and you know, you, it, it was a, a huge blow. See, you did it. Dang it. Already. <laughs> Already. Already. Dang it. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Um, but just the idea of appreciating what you have and appreciating the people around you and getting things done because you're going to get sideways, sometimes knocked literally, you know, in the ditch sideways and you have to figure out how to move past that. Absolutely. Can you describe for us one specific lesson that he taught you? Oh, there's so many. Um, the first one that came to mind is one day my sister and I were supposed to go out and flip the bales because they were drying in the field and if you and it was the rain was coming and so we were going to have to flip them and let them dry out and um, we didn't get it done during the day and so dad got home from work at 6 30 or 7 and we fed the cows and we were out there about 9 30 or 10 at night flipping those bales because otherwise they would be ruined um, and so and but dad was out there with us so it wasn't um you know i was pretty grumbly about it at the time i remember but it's what had to happen to feed the cows and he came and helped us and taught us how to do it and believe me the next time he said flip the bales during the day we did it 
<laughs> that's right. That's so. right. You know, your dad wasn't the only one who gave you those kind of lessons about what the expectation is and you better meet it. Can you tell us about a lady named Bonnie? I can. Yes. <laughs> um, probably the three most influential people in my life have been my dad and uh, my grandmother, my, his mom, and then Bonnie Short. She was my high school journalism teacher. And see, and then once I start, it doesn't stop. So uh, my staff is laughing, I know, because they always look at me to see if I'm crying. Um, There's strength in tears. So, yeah, that's true. That's true. There's nothing wrong with emotion. In fact, we would be better off if we had more of it, I think, sometimes. Um, but anyway, so Bonnie was my high school journalism teacher at Newton High, Go Railroaders. And um, she came in my junior year. And the, the, the teacher had been there before was a good teacher, but we didn't really have deadlines and things. And we'd get pizza on Friday night and turn things in late. Well, then my junior year, um, I was assistant editor of the paper, I think, I'm not sure. Um, and we didn't get finished. It was so old, it wasn't all this desktop publishing stuff. Now we actually had like strips of type that we would glue onto pages. Yeah, I'm super old, you guys. Um, and we didn't get the headlines, the cut lines, and some of the pictures down. And it was supposed to go to press at five o'clock on Friday night, and it did. And needless to say, when your friends get the paper a week later and there's none of that on the page, um, and you know, of course, your high school friends harass you. The principal called in the leadership team of the newspaper and wanted to know what had happened. Um, we never missed a deadline again for the next two years. So um, it was those same kinds of lessons that nobody got hurt, but man, we got embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But we learned that five o'clock meant five o'clock and, and we held to it. So, wow. and Bonnie and I are still in touch today. So if you all had a teacher that was a great influence on your life, make sure you keep in touch with them because it's important for them to know that and to see you grow as an adult, I think. Oh, absolutely so. right. So journalism was, was your thing. Yes. Tell yeah. me why. Um, I, like to, I like people. Um, I like to tell stories. Um, I've kept a journal since before it was called a journal when it used to be called a diary. And I have all of them in a box. They're hilarious to read what angst, you know, captures a fifth grader's heart. Um, but um, I, I, and I, and my, my degree is actually in magazine journalism because I like the idea of having six weeks to develop the story and get a lot of feedback as opposed to six hours, which is, you know, what, what daily news, news um, and journalism is. I only had one job in that role, but it's been a fantastic degree. Um, you know, many of my friends know we have long conversations and arguments about the appropriate use of a comma, whether or not the Oxford comma is important. I really do know how to use a semicolon. Um, so the communications degree helped me learn how to speak to people, but also any job, any role that you have in life, you need to be able to communicate speaking, writing, whatever form. Absolutely. It was really interesting to see how your jobs and the different uh, professional experiences that you had had led you to the work that you're doing with the yeah. Community Foundation. But for us all to be able to appreciate that journey, kind of talk us through some of the positions that you had and some of the lessons that came with some of those positions too. Okay. Um, so my first real job in philanthropy was at the Indianapolis Zoo, which was fabulous because yes, you know, everybody, everybody talks about it's a zoo and there it really was. You have a bad day at the office, you get to go to the zoo for lunch or whatever. Um, but I started out as a grant writer there um, and I'm convinced only worked, talked myself into that job because the woman who hired me actually was really a grammar nerd as well. Um, so it was um, funny because we, we talked about it later that I really didn't have the qualifications she needed except I could write and communicate. Um, so I was there and then was a membership manager and that was my first exposure to management, which was really challenging. Um, and I ended up having to fire the first person that I supervised and I literally had nightmares about that. Um, so, so the idea of being in that role without proper training was scary, um, but you know, you figure it out. Um, so was at the zoo for a while. Um, and moved around a fair amount, just as many people do when you're a little bit younger. Um, I had a great opportunity to work for the Illinois Board of Regents, which is similar to the Kansas Board of Regents. Um, very, very political job. So learned a lot about the idea of understanding both sides of the argument and, and the, the true value of relationships to, you know, if you need help from someone that you can't just call them up and say, hey, I need this. You have to already know them and trust them and they have to have the same feelings for you. Um, and then was in Salina for a couple of years, um, worked for a software publishing company as the marketing director, um, and then also worked as mar in marketing for Kansas Wesleyan, which was really a lot of fun because I was the marketing department. Um, so wrote magazines, I had fantastic student interns, which they thought they were getting great life experience. I was getting a lot of really good free help, so it worked for everybody, I hope. <laughs> um, and then moved to Wichita and spent a couple of years at Coke working with the foundation and corporate giving, um, and then spent nine years with youth entrepreneurs. And that's when I really, um, started working with youth groups and understood that I, I loved the idea of being able to influence 
um, young people in a positive way and to help push them and challenge them and hopefully use my life lessons to help them grow as well. Absolutely. When you were working in one of your positions with um, Coke, uh -huh. you kind of talked about what you discovered about yourself in that role and that you were a connector. You were the connector to Liz Coke at that time. Mm -hmm. Talk about what that discovery was like for you then. Well, uh, you know, when you work for a large company like Coke and, and Liz was the board chair at Youth Entrepreneurs. Um, and so people would call and, and want access to her. It's just, you know, the nature of of the, um, you know, the local celebrity that she is. And, and I learned that sometimes it made sense for, for her to talk, sometimes it didn't. Um, and that's really been helpful through the Girl Scouts and now absolutely with the Community Foundation. Um, just that idea that I may not know the answer to something, but I know Christina Long and I also know Jeanette Everett and the two of them are gonna be able to figure it out. And so that idea of making sure that people know the people they should know um, and, and bringing people together. Um, and I'm fortunate enough in my role at the Community Foundation that I get to interact with a lot of people. And sometimes if somebody new comes to town or someone's in a new role, I hope that I can connect them to people who can help them be successful. And then in the end, help our community all together grow. That's right. And so being a great connector, being a wonderful communicator, it has helped you to be able to achieve lessons and also be able to achieve advancement in your career. But there were some trials that you faced at your job, particularly when it came to the Girl Scouts and having to have the assignment remind me of having to combine seven yeah. councils into one. Yeah, this Talk was, about um, what you learned about yourself through that. Certainly. Um, so the Girl Scouts nationally realigned. Um, it was mostly driven by financial need and a very, a lot of evolution in the organization that I'm not sure the organization locally or nationally had really kept pace with, um, as many, many youth and membership organizations are struggling with. Um, so I had not been a Girl Scout as a, as a child. I'd been a very active 4 -er, And so I was hired to combine seven councils into one. So it was 80 counties in Kansas. Um, I've been all over the state. I love Kansas. Um, and um, and many people were not in favor of the realignment. And so it was something that was mandated nationally. And I showed up at our first board and staff meeting and I'm all, you know, ready, raring to go. And they're all on the other side of the room going, wait a minute, what, who are you and what are you doing? So I, it, was, um, it was a very challenging time. Um, there were people who really, and sometimes it was personal, sometimes it wasn't. I tried not to take it personal at all. Um, but just that idea of I had been hired to make change in an organization. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody understood the magnitude of that and nor the historical sentiment for some of the councils that had been combined. Um, so I spent lots and lots of time driving around the state, talking to people, lots of volunteers who were unhappy um, and trying to help them see that, um, you know, the, the idea of cookies, camping and crafts is still a very strong underpinning for Girl Scouts, but so is Girls of Courage, Confidence and Character. Um, and, you know, and they wanted to do rocketry and STEM programs and science and um, all of that could be possible, but we had to evolve and change as an organization. So um, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about other people. Um, I learned the value of a well-placed bowl of peanut M&Ms because um, people weren't really talking to me at first. So I put the M&Ms at the back of my office and to get candy, they had to come in and talk to me. So, um, and I, I as, as I showed Christina, I knew that I'd finally been a little bit accepted into the, into the um, space, I guess, when once I was gone and they kidnapped my M&Ms. So they were playing jokes on me. So I thought it worked out pretty well, but it was a fantastic organization. Um, and again, you know, I could touch base with the people that we were trying to help. I'd go to camp and canoe with the kids and um, go to, go to troop leaders or go to troop meetings. And, you know, I don't know how many boxes of cookies I would buy every year. Um, it's just very important for those girls to see their role as a leader in whatever way that is, in their family, in their job, in their school. Um, and Girl Scouts gave me a great, a great opportunity to meet a lot of fantastic young women. Thank you for sharing that. You, you mentioned that you learned a lot about yourself during those times. Give us an example of what you learned about yourself during that time. Uh, I, I probably the most important thing I learned is that, that I could, even if I have the title of CEO, and have the ultimate decision making. If I come in and say, this is what we're gonna do, it doesn't work. You have to get ideas from everyone. And maybe, and we talked a lot about <laughs> the Girl Scouts, um, that, we, that sometimes you couldn't compromise. Sometimes the decision had to be made, especially if it was around girl safety or something like that. But on our leadership team, which was a fantastic group of women, um, we would commit to the idea. And so maybe compromise wasn't possible, but we commit to the idea in the leadership room. And you can cuss and discuss there, but once we leave that room, we're committed to that idea. And so there's none of the, well, it wasn't really my idea, I didn't like that. It's just that idea of commitment to the decision and carry through. But then on the back end of that, if we made the wrong decision, especially me, um, you have to own up to that and say, yeah, I made a mistake or this was the wrong decision. Um, 
because I was answered, answered to a board and literally 15,000 girls, you know, that I was responsible for their experience. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that because fast forwarding to now with the community mm -hmm. foundation and some of the incredible work that you all have been doing and giving anyway, when you came aboard, there was a, a change that was going to be made. And that change ended up being in the format of the Chung report and the Chung yeah. work. Um, and not everybody was happy. No, um, that time. They, they weren't. And, um, you know, the, the idea of the courageous conversation that we used a lot in the Girl Scouts um, came to the Community Foundation as well. We had been doing great work for 25 years, but we hadn't, as our board said, we hadn't really um, made any change, any big change, and we hadn't really asked any significant questions. So that's what we set out to do. And um, that the first major project came out in the form of our work with James Chung, our Focus Forward effort. And then thanks to the Bastion family, and we have the Chung Report, which really helped us capture the idea of challenging the status quo in Wichita and looking for the change that needs to happen. Um, and we had people saying that's not true. Um, we had people that made them very uncomfortable. Um, in the end, most people admitted that um, it's just hard to hear it all in one, in one delivery. Um, but James is from here and, you know, loves Wichita and, and did some really fantastic work for us. And now literally, so he hasn't been back for a couple of years, but the things that we're funding and working on now are all a part of what James helped us identify as need for change in Wichita. But you had to stand firm to the truth that you saw in the yeah. work about, again, having those courageous conversations. Yeah. Did you always feel, Shelley, as the face of the organization um, in many respects, you know, that, that leadership face, did you always feel equipped to be that? Um, sometimes no. You know, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate. I've had tremendous board chairs at the Community Foundation, um, and I'm, I'm not going to name them all off, but they're fantastic people who understand the role of my little side note here on, if you're on a board of directors, you're the governors, you're the governor's governance, not the operators, let the staff do that. Um, <laughs> Cause sometimes board gets, boards get confused there, but the board supported this effort and we have an amazing staff um, and, this, and the staff, you know, we, we worked with James to do that. We would spend hours sometimes talking about, is this the right thing? Or if someone would get upset about that, um, one of the things that we did is, um, is diversity. And we thought we were so close to that work. Sometimes that can be a problem. You get so close to it, you think, well, everybody understands what I mean. And we thought we had diversity addressed through the entire presentation and realized that we thought that, but the rest, that it didn't come out publicly there. So as people talked to us about it, we called them, we took them to coffee, we had lunch. We helped us, we helped them help us see how we could have done that in a different way. Um, so, you know, fake it till you make it is probably something that happens to most of us who have any, any kind of leadership position. Um, but I also think back to the idea of you have to be courageous, you have to, you have to decide what you're going to do and do that, but then know sometimes you're going to have to correct your course. Um, and, you know, the word pivot is so overused now with COVID, but who knows what's going to happen in any of our future businesses and lives. And so that idea of you know, you're, you're straight on the goal, but you have to be flexible and nimble in how you get to that goal. Um, and, and that just plays itself over and over in all of the work we're doing at the foundation. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to throw a question at you. Okay, I'm ready. Answer it top of mind okay. or based on what you feel in your heart. Okay. If people were to ask you, Shelly, what's your brand? What would you say? Um, carrot cake, <laughs> orange clothes, talking, and I love people. So people. carrot cake's my specialty. Um, I do love to bake. Um, uh, um, just uh, the idea of a connector, of somebody who cares about the community they live in. My family came to Kansas by covered wagon in 1876 and homesteaded in, in Winfield. Um, you know, I have nails from the, the first sawed house, sawed and log house that they built. Um, and so that idea of that's who I am. Um, I'm from Kansas. I belong in Kansas. Um, you know, I, there, I think... I just got back from Colorado. It's a beautiful place, very safe place to travel, but there's nothing more beautiful to me than the tall grass prairies in Kansas. So that's who I think I am at my core. Absolutely. To discover, again, from your journey, started as a farm kid, uh -huh. and now you're in all of these corporate spaces. You are the <laughs> face of amazing work. Um, what's the insecurity behind that? Say that again. Where's the insecurity behind that? Um, you talked about some some people caring about, again, this public figure yeah. that you put forward, but behind there, there's still just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, my, my sweet and poor husband, Cameron, knows I always struggle with what do I wear. Sometimes I send pictures to my friends or to Courtney on my staff, oh, which one should I wear? <laughs> um, because I am the most comfortable in boots and jeans and a t-shirt. Um, 
you know, I was, Chris, I was messing with my hair beforehand. So just that idea of the face that I present, truly, I'm 55 now, the older you get, um, you know, it, it makes less, it's less important, mm -hmm. I would say, of what that public image is. And it's more important that all of you see the authentic person that I am, um, which I hope I'm presenting today. Um, but it's still the idea of if, if I'm going to be accepted in a room of people who are professional, I have to, I have to meet a certain standard. Um, and that's what I think sometimes I've had folks call who struggle because they don't feel like they have a seat at the table or whatever. Um, and sometimes you have to wait until that opportunity presents itself. And hopefully I can be a connector or convener and help you in that way at some point if it makes sense. So. And you do it so well. And to be able to be that, despite, again, we all have those insecurities when we're coming into new spaces or when people are projecting onto us responsibilities that, yes, we have, but they have the expectation we're going to hit it every yeah. single time, specifically for professional women. I mean, we're all yeah. carrying that. So I appreciate you sharing that. When it comes to your space where you are just moving in your flow and in your <laughs> vibe, talk about what that space is like for you, Shelly. Um, being around, being around people and working on things that, that we can see are going to affect going down the road. Um, we're, we were supposed to have a board retreat in March and it didn't work out because our consultants couldn't come in and COVID and everything. So now we've got a plan and we're going to roll it out over the next three board meetings. And it's really fun and exciting to work on that because we can shape what that's going to be and then get the feedback from our board and staff and figure out what's going to come next for the community foundation. So that's, I love doing that. Um, and I think, you know, when I'm relaxing, um, my newest thing that I'm like totally in love with is playing the cello. Um, my, I have some dementia in my family and I thought, I don't, I don't really like to do puzzles and stuff like that. So what am I going to do that's going to be so hard my brain is going to work that I'm going to keep doing it. And I love cello music. So my buddy Ebony hooked me up with my cello teacher, Quinn. And a year or so ago, I started taking a cello and taking cello lessons. It's so hard. I am so not musical. <laughs> um, but, you know, I practiced last night later than I, I should have been in bed because I love that experience. Mm -hmm. So that idea of pushing myself in some way. Um, but then also spending time with Cameron and Lando, and we have a big backyard. Um, we had a great time hiking in Colorado. Um, I, the, my three sisters and my mom, I'm really close to them. Um, and, and so working super hard, but then making sure that you take a break and do that. And hilariously, the cello is one of those things for me because I set a goal <laughs> how much I was going to practice. So even mm -hmm. though it's my relaxation, it's also a part of how I operate the best. Absolutely. And I think it's so important that we realize how we operate the best. Yeah, yes. So anybody who uh, gets the privilege of following Shelly on Facebook, we get to see <laughs> all of her wonderful cooking, uh, the results of her cooking. We get to see her in her moments with her faith, telling the wonderful stories from communion that yeah. I so appreciate yeah. that you share. I love that. Yeah. Um, family is so important to you and to us in our journeys. Mm -hmm. There's Something about your journey, though, that we spoke about yeah. that you wanted to make sure that we cover today as well as it relates to family. Certainly. Um, so I don't have children. Um, I have three fantastic stepchildren now, thanks to Cameron. Um, and that's something that just came up as Christine and I were preparing for this. But I think the idea of, of having children um, is so ingrained in our culture. And if people don't, we don't necessarily treat that in an inappropriate way. Some people choose not to have kids. In my, in my instance, um, I spent eight years doing fertility treatment and it was not successful. It's, it was expensive and it's hard. Um, and there may have been a cocktail party or two and I said something inappropriate to people who ask about it because it's none of their dang business. Um, and so I think, I think mental illness or mental health and things like infertility are things we don't talk about um, and we have to. And so if any of you are facing those things, give me a shout. We talk about it. Um, but just that idea of the expectation and, I, and talking about diversity and inclusion and equality and all these very equity, very, very important words. Um, I was in a discussion about diversity and inclusion with a, with a facilitator. And this woman said, well, you know, because we all have kids, you know, and she spent like 10 minutes talking about this, this world that was her world and wasn't my world. Um, and I know, you know, diversity is defined at so many levels. And that was an area I didn't say it to her because I was too polite. But the idea of that's an area of, of how I'm very diverse from her that she hadn't thought about. Um, so it's a thing, you know, it's a biological thing. And sometimes we make it a stigma or we judge people because of it. Um, you know, and, and I, I went through a divorce, which was horrible. Um, I'm very, very happily married now. And I got counseling because that's, that helped me. Um, 
when my counselor retired, I set up a couple sessions and he was like, oh no, is everything okay? I said, well, I, I can't go to lunch with you because of the whole client patient thing. I just want to see you again because he helped me so tremendously. So um, I think those are things that until we talk about them, there's going to be that stigma and people are going to be judged on that and they shouldn't. It's, you know, I mean, it's no different, you know, if I had a disease, I would take the medicine to get better. If you have some sort of a mental issue that you need to work through, do it. If you have infertility, do it or talk to somebody about it because it can be long, long down the road can cause harmful um, things for you if you, don't, if you don't address it when it's happening. I appreciate the level of vulnerability that you shared because again, it struck deep with me as well. So I also have gone to a psychologist and Good for you. my problem is I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> I had well, no idea, but I, you had to oh. get deeper and being able to have those, com yeah. you rolled your eyes. Oh, well, I can <laughs> totally well. Being able to be in that, being able to be in touch with ourselves, to be able to look and yeah. work on the inner self. Right. That is just as important as everything that we do to work and present for our outer right. self. Right. So I'm glad that this was able to touch on that experience as well. When you think about your time, your moment in Wichita and the promise of the city today, what is your role in it, Shelley? What is your role in making Wichita better today? Well, I hope through our work at the Community Foundation, we can ask questions that some people aren't asking and we can push in areas that need to be pushed. Um, you know, the Riverfront Legacy Master Plan, we're on hold right now because of COVID and, and what, it, what it means for the economics of our city. Um, but that's something to keep people a lot younger than me here and for your kids to want to come back, Christina, right. <laughs> we're going to have to have those kinds of places um, here for Wichita. Um, something that we're working very hard on and Courtney Bankson and our staff is leading this charge with journalism and we're working on a journalism collaborative. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of work. We're fortunate we're a Knight Foundation city and their mantra is an informed and engaged community uh, makes a stronger democracy and we believe that and we believe that, you know, journalism is underfunded and, and we're trying to create a space for journalists to be more successful in Wichita. Um, and then we, we also think, you know, obviously I love nonprofits and think they're a huge part of the success of any city or country. And we know that nonprofits have scarce resources even before COVID hit and, you know, just turned the world upside down. Um, and so James Woods on our staff is working on a program called Magnify where we can lift up and support nonprofit leaders. The first thing to go is professional development. Mm. And I make the case that many nonprofit leaders have to be more entrepreneurial yes, than, than for-profit leaders because they have to do more with less. Um, and so I hope that all of these programs can help us continue to push Wichita and that we use that courage again. And the authentic voice that the foundation is, is forming, I think we're still in the process of making it, but we're really seeing, you know, we don't have any government money. Um, so so there's this, we have this space where we can ask some questions that make people uncomfortable, but it doesn't mean we're trying to, we're, you know, we're not trying to make people mad. There's a you difference. have to, you know, the, the, there's a million ways to say it, but the phrase of you have to get through it to get to it. And mm -hmm. that's what we think the foundation's role is now, Absolutely. is to ask those questions. So you've been asking critical questions as a foundation. The last quest question that I'll ask okay. you before we go to breakout rooms is, what's que what question are you asking yourself as you look at the next role, the next success, the next breakthrough that's personally ahead for you? So personally, um, I need to be healthier. Um, I, I, I don't really like to work out. I like how I feel after I work out. Um, so I'm working on eating habits, a little less carrot cake, no. <laughs> and a little more exercise. Um, Lando loves it when we take our long walks. So personally, just to focus a little more on my physical health. Um, and then I think for the foundation, something we should have been in, involved in a long time ago is racial equity or inequity. And we're exploring that now of how can we step into that space, make some impact, work with people like you, Christina and Janetta with the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force on the Chamber and figure out a way um, that we can have impact and and maybe it's not even necessarily funding but bringing the right people together to have the right conversation to make a better wichita well i thank you for all that you're doing for a better wichita you. you are just incredible and i really appreciate you, you taking time to share with us today thank you so again just like last time we can't just keep this conversation here between me and shelly we want to activate you all in this space and so taking the conversation to the next step is for you all to do in breakout rooms in a moment you'll receive a prompt to join a breakout room and we're going to ask you to spend about 10 minutes allowing everyone the opportunity to discuss what you've heard in order to kick out kick off the breakout rooms you're going to um, first spend some time introducing each other and we do recommend that you go in ABC order and ladies 
guys who are on the call, please do not make it awkward. Go ahead, if you have a, a inclination to lead the conversation and put some order around it, do that. We want the breakouts to be a wonderful time for you all to share and discuss your ahas and takeaways. After those introductions and after the sharing of ahas and takeaways, um, we will rejoin the main room and we'll bring everyone back together for some overall Q&A with Shelly from the audience. Thank you.
Well, welcome back from the breakout rooms. I hope that you all were able to share some pretty insightful takeaways. And also, I hope that you all were able to come up with some questions as well. Uh, we have several that have come in, so we will definitely pose those to Shelly, but there is still an opportunity. If you would like to chat your question, we do invite you to do so. So Shelly, we're gonna hop into Q&A now. Okay. All great. right. So the first question is, what was your biggest barrier or obstacle in your journey? Probably just getting out of my own head. Um, doubting whether I could do something or, um, you know, like worrying about what I'm going to wear, those sorts of things that sometimes, because uh, I am a worrier, um, and sometimes that kind of stuff would hold me back. Um, and again, as I've gotten older, I've learned it doesn't make that much difference. So um, I think just to trust yourself and surround yourself with people. I have an amazing group of friends. We get together every couple of weeks, and I have one of my best friends lives in Phoenix. I talk to her on Sunday. Give, give yourself that support um, find your find your people or tribe or whatever the word is now that we're supposed to be using um, to support you and help you understand your value and your skill and and give use that to give you confidence. Absolutely. I love that. Get you some good people around. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Question number two, your favorite moment in your journey. Describe it. Oh, my gosh. There have been so many wonderful moments. Um, probably. So we just went to Colorado, but 10 years ago, I went to Colorado with Cameron um, before we were married and had a fantastic vacation. And that's probably one of my fondest memories of knowing that there's this wonderful person who's going to let me be who I am and be the role I want to be in the community and support me every step of the way. So. Yes. Aww. Oh, dang it. Cameron has come up several times. You called him, <laughs> what, the calm in your storm? He, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> hey, Cameron, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question three. You talked about pain points. Give us some advice about how to overcome pain points and how do you push through? Um, so growing up, we would, you know, the whole idea of you just suck it up and make it happen, which can be a good thing to do, but sometimes, sometimes you, you need to stop, you need to pivot, you need to turn, you need to find people to help. Um, so I try to, to step back and think about what's causing the pain or the tension or the stress. Um, and I pray about it. Sometimes I go sit in church and think about it. Um, sometimes I journal about it. And sometimes I talk to friends about it. But just that idea of probably the most important thing is recognizing that it's there and then figuring out my best way to get past it or move around it or do whatever I need to do. That's good. Sounds good. All right. Another question. You guys are sending good questions and thank you. <laughs> Where will you be 10 years from now? Well, I hope I'm still at the Community Foundation. <laughs> um, I hope we have a bigger staff and more assets under management, which just means we can get more money into the community. Um, um, we're interviewing for a communications job right now, and one of the, the young women asked, what, 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 how do you see the foundation being? And I launched into this big plan of what I have. So um, I hope I'm in the foundation. I hope I'm um, still playing the cello and can play a whole lot better than I can play now because I'm really bad. Um, my goal is to be able to play a duet with Ebony on the piano someday. Oh, so Ebony. That's my goal. Yeah. <laughs> Ebony um, can play. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> Ebony's amazing. Um, and I hope that I continue to have this kind of joy and that, and that we see that Wichita has the kinds of things to keep the long kids here in town, to keep the kids around and um, that it's the place that we wanna be, that our economy is righted, you know, I love our aviation sector, but we've got to continue to the work to diversify and the partnership is working so hard and the chamber is working so hard to make all that happen. Um, so I hope all the things we're working for at the foundation are at least on their way of coming true. Um, and that personally, I'm, I'm still in this great spot I am now. Absolutely. You keep talking about the Wichita of the future. Uh -huh. uh, there's a question that came through that asked you to give some advice about how to begin mentoring the next generation or the next set of leaders. Yeah. Um, well, I think everybody's a leader and, and in some way or other, you know, and, and at whatever level. Um, and if people don't think they are, I think I would encourage them to stop and think about what that is, even if it's your, you know, with your little brother or sister or someone in your team at work or whatever. Um, so I try to be as accessible as I can be um, to talk to people and meet with them. Um, I've been a part of some formal mentoring programs. Um, I think it's really important to have like a mentor. I had a young woman one time who called me and wanted to be her mentor. And I said, what does that mean? And we kind of laughed because neither of us really knew. So that idea of finding someone that you connect with um, and then defining what that's going to mean and look like. Um, but then also 
um, just being friendly. And you know, I love Twitter. Courtney taught me how to tweet. I absolutely <laughs> love social media. And the idea of following those people and retweeting their stuff, or if you see something that they have a good idea, call them and ask them about it. Um, and and encourage and just be encouraging um, mm -hmm. to whom to whoever that is, um, whether they're young or old. I learn more from people younger than me every day, um, and I think that's a huge key to success as a leader as well. That's good. So it seems like every great leader, since you mentioned leaders, every great leader tends to have kind of a few books that have inspired them or motivated them along their journey. Can you share with us those titles that motivated you? Certainly. Um, so it's not a book about leadership at all, but it's shaped my life more than any other book. And it's called Being Mortal um, by Atul Gawande. It's um, A-T-U-L-G-A-W-A-N-D-E. Um, he's a physician and he talks about how we don't address end of life issues mm -hmm. and palliative care. I mean, obviously with my experience with my dad and then my sister's husband died from leukemia and I see all these people who prepare and spend so much time planning their lives and then death comes and, the, and they're just completely derailed. Um, and so it makes, it makes you think about that. It's a very, very impactful book. I've given many as gifts. I've read it, I don't know how many times. I've made a couple of other presentations just about that book. Um, so I think that helps you think about the life from beginning to end. Um, and, um, you know, the seven habits of effective, of highly effective people yeah. is one of those standbys. Um, yeah. And again, begin with the end in mind, that idea of what do you want your obituary to say and then work towards that, knowing that along the way, the path is going to change a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm reading Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? Um, and as a part of that, my research on what should the foundation do, I understand I've, this is my perspective and I have to make it much broader and understand different, different perspectives. Um, I'm, I just discovered audiobooks a couple years ago, um, so I'm listening to 12 Years a Slave right now, which is very impactful um, and read by Lou Gossett Jr. who can't listen to that voice. Right, right, a great um, voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I, I love novels as well. And so I think that's really important too, because that helps you think about how you think and different perspectives and those sorts of things. So um, I'm in trouble thinking of just particular books. Um, of course, yeah. the Bible is a good one. Um, I have my, my Bible is marked in, in many, many, many places um, <laughs> of things that have been impactful to me and about the cross that you bear about, yeah. you know, I have a lot of passages that are sit in peace with me kind of things because I need a lot of that. So. Mm -hmm. I love that. Tell us one that stands out. One book? One passage in the Bible. Oh. Um, well, the, the, the 23rd Psalms is just, yeah. you know, I go back and back and back again to that. So I grew up Methodist and converted to Catholicism um, and love the structure and the predictability of the Catholic Church. I don't, I don't support or believe everything that they do, um, but I don't, I don't you know, I'm a, I, it's just not in my makeup. And I try to learn and understand the perspectives of the church. Um, but you mentioned earlier my communion with my ladies. I, I, and I miss it. them terribly, but I, yeah. about once a month I take communion to, um, it's almost always ladies, sometimes men in nursing homes. And I miss them terribly, but because of COVID, we can't go see them. Yeah. Um, but just that idea of ministering with your actions, right? because um, I can speak all day long. And if I'm not being a nice person, then I'm not living the life the Lord wants me to live. Exactly. So you've mentioned a lot of things that have inspired you and that you look to as resources to build a stronger, better Shelly, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about what is your favorite podcast okay. or who is someone that you really admire who you follow on Twitter? Okay. My favorite podcast right now is um, by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh. Um, he's, he's a fantastic writer and it's called Revisionist History. And he goes back and looks at things that are reported or believed to be one way and then digs into them. It's absolutely amazing. If you haven't read or listened to anything Malcolm Gladwell's done, I highly recommend it. Um, I follow Coach Kleiman, K-State football coach on Twitter. Um, I follow Patrick Mahomes. Um, so I, I, that's how I get a lot of my sports stuff is through, is through Twitter. Um, and, and I just, I love like Jennifer Zambecki. I've worked with her a couple, uh, uh -huh. two different times. Um, yeah. She's a Twitter maniac. Yes, um, she is. She's yeah, so good. She's very good. So um, I, I like to find local people. Um, uh, and I, I'm not, you know, Todd Ramsey, it's fun to see him on social media. <laughs> He's full um, of personality. He is, you know, Tammy Bradley, she's on our board. She, yeah. you know, and, and that's what I think. I, so I worked for a guy once and he said, I never read the opinion page because I already know what I think. Mm. And now that I'm older, I think what a narrow minded person yeah. that was. Yeah. He's a great guy, but that's why, you know, like I try to read the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. And so that you get those opposing viewpoints and then you can shape what you really believe that way. That's absolutely. You know, when we share journalism as a background. Yeah. So one of the jobs I had when I was at the Eagle was transcribing opinion lines. Oh, so, <laughs> that'll teach you something. Oh, yeah. 
anyway, yeah. you have taught us so much today, Shelly. Um, I cannot thank you enough for, again, giving of yourself as you do for our community, but then taking a moment to tell portions of your journey in ways that can inspire many of us. And so this has been time very well spent. And I do thank you for the gift that you have given us with these moments that we've shared together. Thank you. I, I'm very grateful to be asked to speak today. Absolutely. And so that's all for me and Shelly. Janetta, we'll kick it back to you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to check this. Can you all hear me? Okay. <laughs> Last time I was really talking, nobody could hear me. Let me just say this. Like the previous session of Journey uh, Unseen, the takeaway from this event did not disappoint. Shelly is one of the most passionate people that I know. She's a personal friend of mine and um, she always has an ear for me. But when she mentions, she mentions a lot of C words. I know it is not gonna run some down for you. She mentions being courageous in confidence and character, all having to do with her Girl Scout days. Anyone who knows Shelly understands that she lives up to those words. Um, she mentioned courageous conversations. She's actually brought into that well, quite a bit in her current job. Commitment, the Chung Report, Carrot Cake, Cameron, a lot of that. Uh, she also mentioned Cuss and Discuss, but we'll go, we won't go to that. But um, all of it is for change in Wichita. So thanks, Shelly, as you've always been a change maker for our community, and you continue to help us when we get the chamber, appreciate everything you've done and said today. And although we're eager to have this conversation in person, we knew that the content was going to be powerful and necessary. Again, thank you very much. So speaking of C words, uh, because of COVID, uh, we've converted many of our courageous conversations to virtual platforms, uh, which always allows us to do like a new, this has allowed us to do a new benefit to our chamber members. All of our chamber members now have the ability to watch these recordings like of today's session uh, and some of our, on our virtual chamber events page, it's called members only. And you'll get to see the one from last time will be on after today's event. So these recordings we posted at a later date and you will get an email telling you exactly how to uh, log on and get the recordings from the one from K. Mug Morgan, uh, and then the one from Shelly will follow later. So I'm so pleased with the involvement of these first two Journey Unseen uh, participants and all of you. I'm also proud of the chamber for focusing on women professionals uh, and creating a space that provides opportunity to learn. You all know that how I am about women uh, and intentionality about diversity. And this part, this program, part of our diversity and inclusion under the leadership of Jonathan Long is one that I'm really proud of and I look forward to continuing on more. Um, with that said, I'm excited to announce our next speaker uh, per Journey Unseen, Ms. Colleen Jennison, the Kansas Market uh, Vice President for Cox Communications. Most everybody knows uh, Colleen, if you ever see her in person, just say something like Kate Spade and you got a conversation going on with her. Um, she, if she is going to be our next speaker, you'll need to mark your calendars for September 1st. A link has been provided for you in the chat function. So I encourage you to register now if you haven't already. And next, I have to say thank you to Ms. Christina Long for moderating a very fruitful uh, conversation on growth, vulnerability, adversity, and for always being willing to challenge and keep it 100 with our presenters. Thank you so much, Christina. Thanks to Sigma Theory, our presenting sponsor, Lafay, and the others of you who have joined on today. We appreciate your sponsorship. And special thanks to my friend, again, Michelle Pritchard, for being vulnerable and sharing your experience and knowledge. And if anybody ever wants to know what her favorite color is, it's purple, as if anybody could probably guess. So thanks. Uh, one more thank you to our speaker gift sponsor, after the event, a small as a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you, Shelly, a gift, a box of chocolate from Coca Dosi. Thank you as our gift speaker sponsor, Coca Dosi. So please join me in thanking all of them. Lastly, uh, since we couldn't be in person, those of you who originally registered for this event should be on the lookout for an email that's going to come to you uh, with a meal coupon 
to the Monarch, again, one of our sponsors. So go to, to the Monarch, go down to Delano, go visit them, and you'll get an opportunity to have a, a meal um, on them. So if you have any questions about this digital coupon, contact Trom, and you'll find, I think, her information in the chat room um, as well. Um, let's see if there's something else from here. Thank you for being such a wonderful and gracious example to all of us. Somebody said it better, but I'm saying it back to you. We hope you see you on September the 1st and stay tuned, be safe. Thank you.